give a backstory, usually of a famous person, with details that you didn't know about. Well, in Psalm 34, we find the rest of the psalm that Brother Jonathan read to us this morning as we look at this psalm, and we'll call the first 10 verses a psalm for poor people, a psalm for poor people. So the backdrop of this psalm, according to the title, if it's in your Bible, under Psalm 34, a psalm of David, when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, who drove him away, and he departed. So that's the rest of the psalm we know from what Brother Jonathan read to us out of 1 Samuel 21. David, in chapter 20, had just departed from Jonathan. It was clear now for sure that Saul aims to kill him. Saul is the king. Saul has soldiers. Saul wants to kill David. They embrace, they depart, and now David is alone. He goes to Ahimelech, the chief priest, as we heard read. And David says he's on a mission. It just so happens he forgot any food and a a weapon, which David now is afraid. He's a fugitive. He's on run for his life. Saul is hunting him. He's ultimately going to try to seek political asylum in another country. He needs to get out of Judea because he's going to be killed. So he asks Ahimelech. Ahimelech gives him the sword of Goliath, whom David used to cut off Goliath's head. David's on his way. He's headed to King Achish. And apparently when he gets there, he doesn't think that the servants of Achish will recognize David, but they do. They say, is this not the king of the land, the one that they sang? Saul had slain his thousands, but David his ten thousands. Now get the picture. David is standing with a sword in his hand that's unmistakably Goliath's sword. It's about 15 pounds. It's massive. He's going to Goliath's hometown of Gath. He's going to Goliath's king, King Achish. Achish being the personal name. Abimelech was probably more like a title Pharaoh. He's going to the Philistine king, to Goliath's hometown, holding Goliath's sword where they recognize David. Everyone sang to him, David has killed his ten thousands, which means what? Many of the thousands that David killed were Philistines. This is not a very wise plan. But David, in his haste and in running for his life, perhaps thinking, they likely will not recognize me. They recognize him. David is sore afraid, as was read, and he plays the madman. He lets spittle run down his beard. He scrabbles on the doors of the gate. And Achish lets him go. A marvelous rescue, not because of David's wit, but because of the mercy and grace of God. This psalm, with that backstory, is David's occasion of writing out of this experience. Shortly after, perhaps, what we read in 1 Samuel 21, this poor man cried in verse 6. So David sees himself, not as a wise uh, a crafty guy that, that happened to just think quick on his feet and get out of a jam. He sees himself as poor, weak, afflicted, and helpless. So this is the poor man's psalm. Are you a poor person this morning? Does this psalm speak to you? Well, let's look this morning. This psalm is broken down in two halves, most commentators say. It's rather hard to break it down because David uses the acrostic form to write the psalm. He uses an Hebrew letter for every verse except maybe one all through the 22 verses. But it's broken down in two halves typically. The testimony of David, which we'll call his personal testimony. That's what we'll look at this morning, the first 10 verses. And then the teaching of David in verse 11. Come, ye children, hearken unto me, and I will teach you the fear of the Lord. So later we'll look at the personal training of David. So personal testimony, 1 through 10, 11 through 22, personal training. He wants to teach others out of this experience with God's miraculous rescue and grace. So we'll break down these first 10 verses like this. First, he magnifies God for his deliverance. Second, he remembers God for his rescuing grace. 
And then thirdly, he wants to assure others of God's rescuing grace. So he magnifies, he remembers, and then he assures others that they can be confident too. If certain conditions are met, they can be confident of the same rescuing grace of God. So let's begin in verse 1 as we look at this psalm. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall see or shall hear thereof and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt His name together. So first he magnifies God and he invites others to join him in exalting the name of God together. Beloved, that's why we exist. That's why you should be here this morning. We are a called out assembly of God. We've been effectually called out of darkness into his marvelous light so that we may together magnify, exalt, and lift up high the name of Jesus Christ. That is our goal for all that we do. Now, magnify means to make great, to exalt, simply means to make high. The question then is, how is it that humble, poor sinners, or David himself, who says, this poor man cried, referring to himself, can actually make God great, can actually lift God higher than He is? And of course, we don't, do we? To magnify God doesn't mean to, to increase God's greatness, or to make Him higher than He already is, it means that we want to, as poor sinners, bankrupt, want to make God to seem or look as high as He already is. Now, how does David do that? Bless, praise, boast, glad, magnify. How do we magnify God? We bless God or adore Him. We praise God and thank Him. We boast in God and glory in Him. And then we're glad when we boast. And that is how we magnify and we exalt the name of God. Now let's think about that for a moment. First, that requires us to make a vow of poverty. You have to make a vow of poverty. David says the humble or the poor... That's the same word as verse, verse 6, this poor man cried. The poor hear, and David sees himself as poor, the poor hear about how you magnify God and they're glad about it. A vow of poverty. Augustinian monks make a vow of poverty. Catholic nuns make a vow of poverty. They don't own a car, they don't own a house, they don't even own any money. If they get any income whatsoever, it goes into a, a pot, a, a common account, and it goes out to the, to the communal they live in. Of course, the vow of poverty here is a spiritual vow of poverty. If God is to be magnified in your life, you must make a vow of poverty. You must not own your righteousness. You must not own your own strength. You must not own your own help. You must not own anything because a poor man is just that. A poor man has nothing and is nothing. And God is magnified through people who have nothing, are nothing, but find something in God's amazing grace. Do you qualify for spiritual bankruptcy? Have you made a vow before God? Have you made a commitment before God to come before Him every day, needy, bankrupt, helpless? See, it's only those kind of people that get glad in God. Now, how is that? Because bankrupt people find their gladness not in what they have, because they have nothing, but who God is and what He is for them. People that boast, boast because it makes them glad, do they not? All of us love to boast. Even if it's not the obnoxious kind where people boast in themselves, you, you all have seen that person and perhaps you've been that person before. But even if it's not in ourselves, we like to boast in our favorite restaurant, favorite team, favorite book, favorite vacation, whatever it is, we love to boast because boasting makes us glad. So when God tells us to boast in Him, what's He telling us? We should be glad. 
Whatever you boast in, beloved, you won't be boasting very long, right? There's a lot of talk right now about the new season up coming up, right? College football. All the teams in the country, and at the end of the season, somebody's not going to be boasting. And if you are, one day you won't be boasting, and it probably won't take but a season or two, and you'll find you don't have anything to boast in. But with God, Psalm 145 says, one generation shall praise his works to another. There is never a time, there's never a season, there's never at the end of the season where you think, God, we're, we're boasted all out with God. God is infinitely worthy of our boasting. And you'll never get to the place in your life where you say, there's just nothing more by which to boast in God. Boasting makes poor people glad. Because a poor person has nothing. And then they recognize in God what they have everything. They have the riches of His mercy, the riches of His grace, and the riches of His glory. So it requires a vow of poverty. It requires a resolve. Listen to David. I will, I shall, I shall. It's pretty strong language, isn't it? To resolve means a firm determination to chart a course of action. We'd all have to agree we live in a culture of soft Christianity, right? I'm not just talking about out there. I'm talking about in here, right? I mean, we get wiped out with two services on Sunday. Can't hardly even make it through it. I admit it wipes me out. When I read Hebrews chapter 11 and see the resolve of faith through grace, of people that were tortured not accepting deliverance, they were tortured, sawn asunder, torment, uh, tormented, afflicted, slain, Wandering about in sheepskin and goatskins. They stopped the mouths of lions. They subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness. To encourage us that the grace of God comes through our faith for the same outcomes. If God would so call it to be. We live in a culture of soft Christianity and largely because we live in a culture of comforts and conveniences. I mean, we just get wiped out. David said, I will, I shall, I shall. That's a resolve. It's a resolve of grace. David's not now moving from poverty to pride and say, I'll I'll just get the job done. Because under the grace of God, he finds the strength, he finds resolve, he finds everything he needs as a poor man to do what God calls him to do. Beloved, I encourage you to be resolved as a Christian. Set a firm course of action and stay to it. Is God not worthy of that? Is His grace not sufficient? Is His glory not outstanding? And yet, just the littlest things wipe us out. Let me say, the littlest things wipe me out. (laughs) Sometimes I'm appalled at myself. So a vow of poverty that's going to rest in God's sufficiency and come bankrupt and have nothing and rest in His riches of glory and grace and mercy is a resolve. He is resolved. He didn't say, well, I'm going to think about this. I will, I shall praise Him with my lips. My soul shall boast in the Lord. You see, we don't, this is not our default mode, isn't it? We have to go to the factory settings in the computer, the system preferences, and click that button that says resolve. Every day, every day we have to have a new resolve. Or what happens? We go back to meandering. We go back to being soft. I include myself there. So there's a vow of poverty. There's a resolve. And then look at the frequency. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord, implied at all times and continually. And the humble shall hear thereof and be glad. See, that requires a resolve because at all times we're not glad. At all times we're not praising God. At all times we may not feel like blessing the Lord. So the resolve and the commitment, like you resolve to go to work, Tomorrow, are you not? You may not feel like it, but you have made a commitment. Does God demand anything less of us? No. No. So the frequency, at all times. At all times. 
See, when you understand all your times are in his hands, Psalm 31, 15, all your times are in God's hands for his exaltation and your good, then by grace we can make a commitment. By grace we can move forward. By grace we can ask for grace because we are poor people. A poor man has nothing to get the job done. He has no resources. He has no money. He has nothing. He's a mendicant. He's a beggar. All he has is the complete sufficiency of the cross of Jesus Christ to empower him to take one step at a time. So David begins this psalm magnifying God for his deliverance Other people like him who are poor, they hear and they're glad. And why are they so glad? Because they have nothing. Imagine people magnifying God because of all that they do. That doesn't make a poor person very glad, does it? David said in Psalm 69 verse 30, he wrote, I will sing praises to the Lord. I will magnify God with thanksgiving. Praise is often associated with thanksgiving in the Bible. This shall please the Lord better than an oxen and an ox or a bullock that has horns and hooves. The humble shall see thereof and be glad. Now that's a parallel except for the word hear, the word see. Why are humble people, poor people, so glad to hear and to see people giving thanks to God and praising God? Because thanksgiving is saying that somebody's giving you everything that you are and have. It's not coming from yourself as a poor person. The grace of God is sufficient to provide everything you need for life and godliness and anything God calls you to do. That ought to make us glad. Forgiveness, redemption, reconciliation, justification, sanctification. Let him that glories glory in this. Glory in the Lord. Because Christ is all those things to us. So a poor person spiritually who has nothing is glad to hear of your boasting and your praising and giving thanks to God and your adoring God because why are you doing that? Because of all that God is showering you with by grace. So how would you know that you have made a vow of poverty and that you're resolved to praise God? You're a thankful person. I mean, what oozes out of you is the spirit of thanksgiving. I mean, even when you do something good, you thank God for it, right? You're just continually, at all times, thanking God. That's the proof that we are growing in the spirit of poverty when what comes out of our lips is not daily complaint, but daily thanksgiving, daily praise. Do you have anything for which you could thank God for? In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Giving thanks always at all times in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ unto God the Father. Because God is always doing something. He's always giving something. He's always rescuing you. He's always drawing you. And so that's why David says at all seasons, all times we give thanks. Number two. Now he remembers God's deliverance. And often when we remember, isn't that the catalyst for praise and thanksgiving? When you remember the deliverance of God in your life, doesn't that at times stir the words of thanks again and the spirit of praise and magnifying God at how good God is to you? So when we remember, it will stir thanksgiving. And pray. So here's how David remembers in verse 4. I sought the Lord, and He heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto Him and were lightened, and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear Him and delivereth them. So verse 4 and verse 6. David is using the past tense. He's he's thinking about in the first person, verse 4, I sought the Lord. In the third person, verse 6, this poor man cried. That's David. In the first person, verse 4, he heard me. In the third person, he saved him. Verse 4, 
from all my fears, verse 6, out of all his troubles. David's already starting to assure others when he uses third person, isn't he? But he's referring to himself. David prayed. David sought. God answered. God delivered. And the upshot is that David says he's delivered from all of his fears, all of his troubles. Which you may say, well, when I remember God like that, I remember that I'm still in trouble. Still afflicted. Been going on a long time. I prayed. I thought like David. I don't think I can say the Lord delivered me from all my fears and all my troubles. Maybe you're like Asaph in Psalm 77.3. I remember the Lord and I was troubled at the memory. What do we make of this? And furthermore, who wouldn't be praising and magnifying God when you just got delivered from a death like that, right? I mean, that, that's kind of the easy part, right? Do you know where David is after he's delivered? Maybe David didn't move from the frying pan to the fire, but he did move from the fire back to the frying pan. He's in a cave called Adullam. 1 Samuel 22. He is alone. He has no food. Maybe he has the sword Goliath, or maybe they took that sword from him. David is at a low point in his life. His mighty men and his family do not join him immediately, but later. He is away from one king. He's somewhere at the border of Judea and Philistia. And Saul is still hunting him. He's a fugitive. He's low, but he's magnifying God. And he's saying, the Lord delivered me. So that tells us, even if you're at a low point, there's a place to praise and exalt God and give Him thanks for His deliverance. But what is this deliverance? David clearly got out of one trouble, even though he's not out of the other trouble yet. That's why he's in the cave. He's being hunted. <clears throat> I think verse 5 is strategically located between these two verses to help us understand more about what David is saying when he's saying all our fears and all our troubles. Yes, ultimately one day that will take place, but, but David is referring in the present tense. How is it that David was delivered from all of his fears when there's still fear all around him and all his troubles when he's re really still in trouble? Right? It's just a... A delay right now. He's, he's kind of got sanctuary at the moment. But at any moment he could think Saul's going to walk through the mouth of that cave and I'm a goner. Verse 5, they looked unto him and were lightened and their faces were not ashamed. They looked unto him means they consider, they have regard for God and were radiant, beaming, glowing. And their faces, which means... The word picture he's giving is their faces were uh, gl uh, glowing and beaming and radiant, and they were not ashamed or disappointed. So what is, what is David saying here? Is David saying, look, if you just pray like I did, the promise of prayer is you can just announce your trouble. Trouble, you're about to leave in just a few minutes, because as soon as I make an amen to my prayer, God says, it's gone. It's over. We know that's not true in our own experience. Right? I think the point David is saying is that the promise of prayer is not that God removes every difficulty and every trouble, but that God is going to deliver you. There is going to be deliverance in the trouble and in the fear by transforming the trouble in an occasion to magnify God. That's deliverance. That's rescuing grace. That's what grace aims to do. David's been delivered not just because he escaped Achish. That's true. He's being delivered because God used the occasion to expose David's weakness so he could see God's greatness and burst forth into praise and adoration. 
that is deliverance. That's rescue and grace. That's what God is going to do through prayer. Look at verse 5 again. They looked and they were beaming. Now we use that about a person to say that their face is beaming. And what do we mean by that? Smiling, maybe? Happy? Pleased? It's a figure for joy. They looked unto Him. They had regard for God. And the result was their face began to glow. There was joy. And their faces were not ashamed. The word ashamed means disappointed or disillusioned. When a person's disillusioned, they're they're disappointed because something didn't turn out like they believed it would. Now you can just start filling in all kinds of blanks on that one, right? I thought he, I thought he wouldn't be this way. I thought she would not not be that way. I thought marriage, I, I thought marriage would be this. I'm so disillusioned. I thought family, I had these expectations. I, I thought family life would be like this. Or I thought my parents, I thought as I got older, my parents, and they're not. You know? we, could, we could go through all kinds of scenarios. That, that dream job, I thought when I got to that place, I'm just disappointed. See, what we need to understand, all disappointment that lingers ultimately makes its way to God as the person you're disappointed with. Right? You see, rescuing grace didn't show up for David after he got to Achish. That was the whole design, wasn't it? It was rescuing grace that brought him to that place, allowed him to go to that place and experience an almost death so that he, like Paul, could what? Learn not to trust in himself, but in God that raises the dead. That's rescuing grace. That's what grace does for us, beloved. And so when we're disillusioned and it lingers because we're going to have disappointment, right? Then ultimately, we're basically saying to God, God, I'm upset. You did not deliver the marriage, the family, the parents, or the life that I expected. I just don't want to go on. Ready to quit. And what are some of the signs of disillusionment that lingers? Well, disappointment with God, we've noted that. Secondly, we lack interest in the things of God. It just, our commitment starts to wane. And what's the point? Life's not going as I thought it would. And trouble here, trouble here, fear here. The commitment that you once had starts to dwindle. The spiritual disciplines that you once had are gone. No more Bible reading, no more prayer. Why? Well, what's the point? You know? I'm just disappointed. Then escapism. You're going to try to fill the void. Some ha- hobby, some activity, something. You got to do something. And, it, and it's not with God because He's so disappointing recognizing we don't verbalize our disappointment with God, but when it lingers and it doesn't lift, because disappointment is part of living, when it lingers, escapism. I've got to find something to fill the void. So you're, you're gone out, filling it with something. And then vulnerability. You're vulnerable now to temptation. Because if you're not sober and vigilant, your adversary, the devil walking about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, is going to devour you. He loves disappointment. He loves disillusionment. Because at that moment, you're ready to just quit. I've had it. And he comes in roaring like a lion. Because our vigilance, our sobriety is gone. Because maybe we've claimed that Jeremiah 21 text, like so many people do, wrongly. You know, God says, I know the thoughts I have to you. I know the plans I have toward you. Not of evil, but good. I'm going to give you an expected end. We're like, oh, yes. And we fill in the blanks of all the expectation. And then it leaves us 
depressed, discouraged, disillusioned, and disappointed. They looked unto him and were lightened. They were beaming. And their faces were not ashamed. Because sometimes we're looking at God to fulfill our own imagined expectations and therefore we're disappointed with Him instead of looking at Him. Our expectation, the psalmist says, is in the Lord. It's in Him. And we think God in our expectations, what God may give us, and certainly who would deny that He doesn't give us an abundance of things. But when that's where we're expecting the real life to take place, the real enjoyment, We're looking to that only through God as a kind of a means and a channel. It leaves us ready to quit. And you don't want to minister anymore, do you? I mean, who wants to talk about a God that you're disappointed in? I'm not not going to serve anybody, minister. I'm not talking to anybody. I'm just utterly disappointed. Then you're perhaps looking to God in the wrong way. Or you're looking at your trouble in the wrong way. Or you're looking at your circumstances. David said, in David's own experience, those that look unto him, they are enlightened and their faces are not disappointed. Now the question is why? Because of verse 7. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth them. Now David is giving us his personal testimony because he wants to encourage us Not that prayer means just pray, just name it, and all troubles are gone. But as we said, we pray God is committed with His rescuing grace to deliver us by exposing things about us. Which if we're not viewing God rightly, what does that produce? Disappointment. The disappointment we have is God's grace at times coming to us to show us what we're looking to and looking at. And it's not Him. Isn't that grace? Isn't that deliverance? Isn't that rescuing? Sometimes we don't get the message. and God is a Father that chastens us, has to turn up the heat. So look at verse 7 and see why is it that, that their faces were lightened. The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear Him, and He is delivering them. Those are present tense verbs. He is encamping, circuit, round about, and he is delivering. So that means David was being delivered when he was on his way to Achish, when he was at Achish, and now when he's in the cave of Adullam. He is delivering. He doesn't just show up to deliver. This is the job description of, of Christ. Now, what does it mean encampeth? It means like to pitch a tent, a hut, a military encampment. Now, now me, I, I like camper, not encampment. Maybe an espresso machine, nice, comfortable air conditioner. Maybe like Titus has, that'd be nice. He hadn't told me, but I'm going to maybe borrow it one day. I like a camper, but to stick with the times that we're in, in, in the Bible, it was an encampment with a tent and a hut, and they were roughing it. Now imagine you had America's military surrounding you in the middle of the night. And you hear a lion or a bear and you're kind of nervous and you peek out of the net and you see all these men cocked with guns. You just go back to sleep. Now that's the visual image. I don't know how many people in a military would be there, but an encampment was a temporary established encampment of a military. But it gets better. It says it was an angel. Now would you rather have an angel or all the American military might? Let me tell you, you'd rather have an angel. An angel could whip all of America in one hour. I just threw the hour in there. I don't know how long it would take. He slew 185,000 Assyrians and stopped, not because he was tired, because the job was over. You say, what about those tanks? It would just go right through the angel. It wouldn't touch them, right? No, you want one angel over all militaries of the earth, but this is better. It's an angel of the Lord. That's even better. Because in Judges 6, we learn this angel... In the Old Testament, when he shows up, he is both distinct from Jehovah and he's identified with Jehovah. This angel speaks to Gideon and he says, The angel of the Lord said, Thou mighty man of valor. So he's distinct. He's an angel of the Lord. But then when the same angel spoke, it said, The Lord looked unto him and said, The angel now is Jehovah. Why would we be perplexed at the incarnation of the New Testament? 
It's all throughout the Old Testament. The angel of the Lord is all infinite power and wisdom and grace because it's Jesus of Nazareth. So it's not an angel that could be aloof and say, Lord, why are you having me encamped by this guy? His feet stink. I don't want to be here. It's Jesus of Nazareth that loves you and gave his life for you. Beloved, he wants to be there. And he encamps 24-7 round about you. And he never leaves your side, ever. The angel of the Lord is delivering you, but how? By exposing your need of the angel. Would anybody say you're as poor as you need to be? Would anybody say I'm as humble as I could possibly be? Would anybody say there's no pride left in me? See, this angel that encamps you is there and he's working his rescuing grace because it says he is delivering you and so exposing your weaknesses so that you rely more on the very angel that's encamping round about you. This was Paul's experience in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, wasn't it? Paul was in trouble. He had a thorn in the flesh. He prayed like David did. You know, when you pray for rescue and grace, say, Lord, rescue me. But what Paul didn't know initially is that rescuing grace brought him the thorn. Lest I be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation that was given me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Lest I be exalted above measure. The gift of rescuing grace was a thorn that hurt. What a gift, right? Paul later understands this through Revelation. He prays three times, rescue me by your grace. Grace didn't just show up to rescue him. Grace had brought him the messenger of the devil himself to use it and overthrow the work of the devil in bringing humility to Paul instead of exaltation, which is what the devil does, right? The devil does not humble people. He exalts people. He kills them with pride. And then he devours them. So the gift of rescuing grace comes to Paul in the form of a thorn. And he prays three times. And the promise of prayer is not what? This thorn's about to go. Whatever it is, it's just about to leave my life. No, it stayed. And what did Jesus say? My grace is sufficient. What grace? The grace of the thorn, first of all. And the grace that is going to rescue by leaving the thorn there. How did it rescue Paul? My grace is sufficient for thee, for out of weakness is my strength made perfect. We could say out of poverty, my strength will be magnified, exalted, or made complete. Paul looks unto the Lord. Now watch this. His face is starting to glow. What did he say? Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my poverty, infirmity. He was not ashamed. Aren't you disappointed with God, Paul? I mean, he didn't do what you asked. You just got to go around in life with a storm, whatever it is. His face was aglow. He was beaming with joy. And he said, so I was glad. Why? For when I am poor, it's weak there, same thing, then I am strong. The angel of the Lord that was encamping Paul every second of his life exposed a potential weakness in Paul that, that could have made him pride or proud, kept him humble. And what was the upshot? Paul looked to Jesus and found him to be the strength, the help, all that Jesus was for him through means of trouble. So David is not saying pray and all trouble goes away. He's saying pray and what happens? You'll be delivered, you'll be rescued by the angel of the Lord that's encamping you and his rescuing race is going to come to show you his greatness by exposing your weakness. So when you feel like you can't go on, The angel of the Lord is there to help you keep going. 
When you feel like you don't know what to do, I don't know which way to turn. The angel of the Lord is there to give you wisdom. Just look at the connection. You have nothing. You don't know. You have no strength. The angel has everything. He knows. Jesus knows. He has the strength. And we could go through any number of expressions that would identify how Jesus comes to us in His strength when we recognize and get to the place. And prayer is that. Isn't prayer the instrument of a poor man? You know, a rich man, he's not asking anybody for anything. He's got it all. But a poor man's begging. So through poverty, we, we reach out and cry to the angel. And the angel that's there exposes our weakness, brings his power, and we're delivered in the trouble. So it is true. The Lord delivers of, out of all of our fears and out of all of our troubles. When we look to him, we can be lightened through the word of God and glow in such a way that our faces, rather than being disappointed with God, we say with Paul, I gladly glory in my weaknesses. Why would you do that, Paul? That's crazy. Glory in poverty? People do that today. You know, they, Years ago, there was a restaurant called Poor Folks, and when you went in there, you, everybody kind of had a smirk smile on your face. Oh, you're poor like us, isn't that great? We're proud to be poor. No, it's not a good thing to be poor, is it? But Paul was glorying in his weakness because then he experienced the strength of the angel of the Lord and the angel gets exalted and Paul gets humbled. That's how God's magnified, isn't it? So David remembers the past deliverance and how God delivers, how he delivers through his rescue and grace. And then he begins to assure others in verse 7, this angel of the Lord that delivered me He's around about all them that fear Him, and He is delivering them also. And then He goes into verse 9, which is the last point, assuring others of this confidence in being delivered. He says, O taste, verse 8 rather, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in Him. O fear the Lord, ye His saints, for there is no want to them that fear Him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Now David turns to others and he's going to encourage them and assure them that this angel encamps you, this angel delivers you, this angel is with you. In two ways, to deliver, verse 7, and then to provide. You don't lack any good thing. Two ways, the angel delivers you, we already looked at that one, and then the angel provides so that you have nothing lacking. Are you lacking anything today? According to the text, you shouldn't be, right? Nothing lacking. But he wants us to know how we secure that blessing. How do we secure this deep assurance of the angel's encampment and his rescuing grace and that no good thing shall be withheld from those that walk uprightly or that trust Him? In this way, those that fear the Lord, which means in verse 9, they trust Him. Verse 10, those that fear the Lord, which means that they seek Him. Now the fear of the Lord certainly means more than that, but it doesn't mean less than this in this context. David defines what he means by fear Him in verse 7 when he says, Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. And then in verse 9, he's going to again state the fear of the Lord and define it in verse 10 as those that seek him. How can I be assured that the angel is with me? Through a poverty of spirit that seeks refuge in Jesus Christ. The word trusteth means refuge. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that runs into the cave. Right? Right? You're one of those kind of people that like to get people to try food that you have eaten and it's good. I am. People don't trust my palate. I have to struggle. So come on, just, just taste it and see it's good. Too many times where I said that and it wasn't so good. I still want them to try. Have you made trial of God? Taste. Experience it for yourself. And see that the Lord, the angel, is so good. 
Blessed is the man that runs into the sanctuary, the pavilion, under the shadow of his wings, in the covert, in the cleft of the rock, all the images of the Bible that speak of sanctuary. But are you one of those people that say, well, that looks good. That smells good. Well, I bet it is good. I'm not going to try it. Or I bet that cave is strong. I bet that pavilion would keep me dry in the rain. I bet if I was under the shadow of those winds, I, uh, wings, I'd be safe. I bet the lightning wouldn't strike me there, but I'm going to hang out here in the rain and do it myself. Well, that's not poverty. That's pride. See, you're, you're relying on your own righteousness, your own strength, your own ability, your own wherewithal to keep yourself safe, dry, fed, whatever it is. So we secure this assurance by running into the sanctuary and trusting in Jesus and making a trial of what He says. And you will find, as Jesus said, He that will do His will will know of the doctrine, whether I speak of myself or of Him that sent me. If you desire to do His will and you work in that way, you'll see that what Jesus said is true. If you will to do what He wills, you will find His goodness. And he will not let you down. And then Paul, uh, David says rather, O fear the Lord, verse 9, ye his saints, for there is no want to them that fear him. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger. They don't do so well. But they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Those that fear the Lord not only trust him, those that fear the Lord seek him. And the upshot is they don't lack any good. Thing is italicized, which means the translator's Put it in there for clarity. You don't lack anything good. Now I'm going to guess that probably some of you lack something that you'd call good today. Maybe a a good thing that if you had it, it would do you good and something you need. But when you want a good thing and you need a good thing, why do you want that good thing? It could be a practical thing. You just need, need need a good lawnmower. You need a good car. A good thing. But see, at the, at the root issue of, of, of every good thing that we could want, say, I'm, I'm lacking that good thing. If I just had the good thing, if I had that one good thing, I'd be so happy. I'd be so fulfilled. I'd be so content. And no, you wouldn't. Because only those that seek the Lord find Him to be the treasure of Proverbs 2, the buried treasure the great pearl of great price, the the treasure buried in the field, the bread of Deuteronomy 8 or John chapter 6. See, David's point is when we're seeking the Lord, what are we seeking Him for? Just the good things? We're seeking Him as the highest good. And if He's the highest good, we say, if I only had Jesus, if I only had the Lord, if I only had God, I would be so happy. That's right, you would. But you won't seek Him. Some of you won't seek Him. Because you're still blind to thinking that what God creates is somehow going to be better than the God who created it. And that's our blindness, isn't it, beloved? That, that's our depravity and our Adam nature. But oh, when the Holy Spirit awakens us and we seek the Lord, we understand that He's the greatest good and that He does give good things. I'm not trying to suggest it's just spiritual good. He gives good things, does He not? If you being evil know how to give good things to your children, how much more should your Father in heaven give good things to those that ask Him? And those good things, if you just look at Psalm 34, if if the lion lacks a good thing called food, that's literal, that's physical, then part of the good things is food and clothing, and what you need. But the Father knows how to give good things, like you being evil, which means you're nothing like God the Father. You know how to give a good thing to your child. If your son asks for a piece of bread, you don't give him a stone. And if he asks for a fish, you don't give him a serpent. You know how to give a basic good thing. Your Father infinitely knows how to give good things, and He doesn't give bad things. Well, that, That calls out a lot of things, right? You may say... This would be so good for me. Lord, could you give me this? He says, no, you don't understand. That would be so bad for you. That's why most of you are not going to be rich. Do you know how bad that would be for you? It drowns men in eternal destruction. 
somebody ever asks you, Brother Mike, why aren't you rich? I couldn't have handled it, I'm sure. I'd probably be a goner. I'd probably leave Christ and love the money over Christ. I mean, I can struggle with that and I don't have much. It doesn't even take riches. So God only gives good gifts and good things, but they are material. He gives good things. He will not withhold any good from those that trust Him and seek Him. And if you need food, if you you need a car to keep trusting Him, it's coming. Is anybody going to say here God hasn't been a good provider? I mean, He is just overflowing. But when we're seeking God as the highest good, what that produces is contentment And a content man really doesn't lack anything, right? I mean, he lacks something, but not like that. He lacks. He doesn't have everything, but he lacks nothing for his contentment. A content man is just that. He's content with what he has. With the little he has. Or the much he has, his contentment is in God. Why? He's seeking him as his contentment. And so when the good comes, that's not the main event. Or when the good leaves, that's not the main event. God is the main event. And so he seeks God for the spiritual hunger and the spiritual bread. And then when he asks God for good things, God provides. And if God withholds, it's not the end Because the good thing he really needs to fill the void of emptiness in the empty tank of love is the love of Christ. And when you seek Christ, it comes. Christ fills us with his presence and his spirit. And so we can ask God for good things we need. He's our father. But we need to know he won't give us bad things. And we need to know the way we secure the assurance that the angel of the Lord is encamping and delivering is that we fear Him and we're growing in our fear. That means we're trusting and we're running into the sanctuary of the grace of Christ and we are seeking. Are you seeking God? That's just an honest question we all need to ask ourselves, right? Just a personal question. To what degree are you seeking God today? Is God the highest treasure and the highest good? If He is, then we're seeking Him to be that. And as poor people, we we come before the Lord. We say, nothing in my hands I bring. But let's just close with that. Everybody raise your hands, if you would. Both hands, empty. Nothing in my hands I bring. Repeat after me. Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. He's everything. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace.